Okay, what's going on YouTube? It's PNG Media News back at you with an, another edition of the Concrete and Steel Chronicles. Today, you're in for a really special treat. I have brother Roscoe. He's one of the co-founders of the Hidden Valley Kings. He's gonna tell you all about the formation of that organization and where that, you know, his, where that eventually took him through. So, so stay tuned. All right, brother Roscoe. So tell me, where are you from, bro? Uh, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, Charlotte, North Carolina. And like, what area of the city did you grow up in Charlotte? I grew up on the north side of Charlotte. Well, uh, I okay. was born on the west side, but I grew up on the north side. Okay, and what was the, what was the community like? Uh, when I first moved into the community, it was it was peaceful. Um, mm. You know, the things that kids do every day, we rode bicycles, we did backflips on mattresses, we played mm. sports. Um, it was, it, it's a middle-class neighborhood, you know, mm, okay. and at one time it was predominantly uh, white. And okay. as the blacks started moving in around the seventies, the, uh, the white started moving out. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, a lot of the houses in Hidden Valley was uh, rent to own. A lot of people was owning their they homes, but I was on the other end of Hidden Valley at the bottom, in which we call uh, Zone 1, which is Wellingford. Um, you had a couple of houses down there that was uh, people was buying, but a lot of us came there under Section 8. Okay. You know? And with that Section 8 and us coming from different urban communities, our mentality came with us, you know, mm -hmm. to that community. Okay, okay. Now, when you say Hidden Valley, was that the official name or is that just kind of a colloquial that people call that area? Oh, no, that's the official name of the uh, community. It's, uh, oh, okay. It has about uh, approximately, I would say, 11,000 residents. Mm -hmm. um, over 72 different streets, you know, but amazingly, um, those of us that grew up over there, we pretty much know everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not from Hidden Valley, anybody will tell you, if you're not from Hidden Valley and you go into that community without anyone, you know, taking you through there that's from there, you go get lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right. So, so, so bad being, so what, what so what, 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 is it safe to say that you all were kind of, in a sense, isolated? Cause it was kind of like a far off, you know, let's say you can get lost in there, you don't know your way around. So that kind of isolates you from the larger community? Uh, nah, nah, because okay. like right beside Hidden Valley, you got Dinglewood, you know, uh, on down, you got Dorada, you know, uh, you had uh, Cedar Green, Woodview. You had other areas that was close to Hidden Valley. Okay. Okay. All right. So you said about the 70s, like I said, more African Americans start moving in and more, and then guess white flight start to take. And you said, you know, people from different areas of the city will come with that mentality. So, so at what point did you see things really start to change? You know, from going from, you know, riding bikes and doing backflips on mattresses to other type of activities? Um, well, I jumped off the porch in 89 when I was 11 mm -hmm. and, you know, people was doing their things then, you know, hustling and whatnot, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't no gang activities. I mean, you had people that did have little gangs, but it was just, you know, 10, 15 here and there, you know what I'm saying? Um, but for the most part, things started to really take change around the early 90s. Okay. You know, and um, that's when, you know, the Kings actually came into existence in like 92, you know, and uh, around 96, it was, um, it was hundreds. And that's when things really started, you know, to turn a little bit. Okay, so tell me about that. How did the Kings form? Like, how did you all come up with that name? What were some of the factors that made you all just 
you know, come into existence in the first place? Well, um, originally, uh, the homie Corn, he was uh, from the west side of Chicago. Okay. And uh, he had a brother named Black, you know, um, they was vice lords and four corner hustlers. One, okay. Corn was a, a vice lord, his brother was a four corner hustler. And um, from my understanding, he didn't get permission because he made all of us vice lords. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, he didn't get permission to start a vice lord branch. And mm -hmm. not only that, he also said that he didn't want to be under no one. He wanted to start something new, you know, so, something that we could be identified for. So he changed mm -hmm. the name from uh, being vice lords to kings, which stood for okay. crucial Islamic Nubian gods, because mm -hmm. corn was actually a five. He was a five percenter, you know, okay. and. Um, when the Kings first started forming, you had like four major neighborhoods, which was Cedar Green, Hidden Valley, North Charlotte, and Dong Village. You know, uh, pretty much the first three that I named is on the north side of Charlotte. Then you had Dong Village, Dalton Village, which was on the west side of Charlotte off West Boulevard. Um, at first, we wasn't like, we wasn't our own hoods. We was all one nation. We was called the Queen City Kings at first. Okay. You know, and um, after Corn died, it pretty much went left. Everyone started branching off and starting their own hoods, you know, because the glue that kept us together was no longer around, you know. Um, apparently, um, the authorities tried to say that Corn committed suicide, but that's on something different. You know, he didn't commit suicide. I, I can tell right. you that, you know. Okay, okay, all right. Now, when he made you all vice lords, did he um, keep it like traditional the way in Chicago where y'all had gang literature to study and memorize and stuff like that? Or y'all, or he just in handshakes and all that stuff and stuff? Well, the handshake is still prominent today. Mm -hmm. The king handshake is identical with the vice lord handshake. Okay. You know, um, when he came with the vice lords, there wasn't no literature passed out. You know, when okay. the king started, the first rules, the laws was uh, considered called the 15 commandments. Um, okay. I didn't really know more about the vice lord literature until I went into the federal system. And I okay. met guys from Chicago that actually you know, gave me a copy of it. Um, and by me reading that copy, I knew and understood right then and there that we didn't have these materials then. Okay, okay, all right. So, all right, so the, so the, so the kings form up and then, so when you all started to get, like you said, after corn passed away and you all start branching off into different guess, factions of the kings, what type of, how did that, I guess, was it a domino effect? Did it more violent start? Or what kind of happened after that between you all as well as between the other neighborhoods? Well, actually, I wasn't around at that time because, you know, I was like about 13. And okay. I was putting in work for my neighborhood. So um, I was incarcerated from the age 13 to 18. Mm -hmm. And... um. During that time, it was wars that was going back and forth between different neighborhoods. And um, one of the reasons was um, Hidden Valley and uh, North Charlotte had went to war. Um, I'm trying to present it without mentioning any names because I'm trying okay. to see who's dead and who's alive. Uh, but in a way, it was a situation after a King meeting uh, a few of my brothers had went, you know, to the store on Sugar Creek um, and they went to go get more beer because they ran out of beer at the meeting. And while they was there at the store, um, some bloods poured up and one of my homies knew the bloods because he went to school with them. And they was out in the parking lot chopping it up and whatnot. And a couple of uh, North Charlotte Kings 
but they was called the Chaos Clan Kings. Some of them was leaving the meeting. And as they was passing by, they seen brothers out there with a lot of red on them. Cause the founder of the Chaos Clan Kings, he was originally from California and he was a rolling 60s crip. And he had already been programmed that blood was his enemy. And he taught all those who came up under his command to not like bloods. So as they was riding down Sugar Creek and seeing, you know, guys standing out there with red bandanas, they took it upon themselves to open fire. And not knowing that it was Hidden Valley Kings out there also that was talking to the bloods. And when the Chaos Clan started opening up fire at the bloods, Kings, not knowing what's going on, they return fire, mm-hmm. you know, as in self-defense. And that kind of like started a war between Hidden Valley and Chaos Clan, you know, and it, and it lasted even all the way up until today to where a lot of people from North Charlotte don't even realize or know why they beef with Hidden Valley. You know, that went all the way back to the 90s. You know, wow. even though Chaos Clan Kings no longer exist in North Charlotte. You know, the um, the animosity still exists. Wow. You know, so what um, no way to iron that out between the two groups? They're saying that it was kind of like a misunderstanding. Yeah, it was a misunderstanding, but it was never ironed out. You know, okay. it had uh, got too far gone because a couple of the members from Chaos they retaliated and shot up one of. Um, the Hidden Valley uh, members' relatives' house. Mm. And once they did that, it was like, we can't rectify nothing, you know, because a little baby was hit in the process. The baby didn't Uh die, but still the baby was hit. So it wasn't no rectifying after that. But um, as time went on, Chaos Clan, they pretty much died off on their own, you know. And Hidden Valley is pretty much the predominant neighborhood that was still pushing the king ideology okay you know now you mentioned bloods and crips you know lost those you know of course you know california gangs and when did they start to infiltrate uh into north carolina around what years was that um when i first really started hearing about the bloods and crips was like the early 90s okay um Actually, I had went to Morganton High Rise and um, I had met a, a blood that was there, you know, and at that time, I believe he may have been the only blood at that prison and he caught hell, you know, mm-hmm. because you're talking about like, it was literally like 300 Crips there, mm-hmm. you know, and I can say that that one blood, he never checked in, he never went on PC. You know, he fought and he fought and he fought until they were just like, man, just give him a pass, man. You know, mm. and I and I respected that, you know. But um, yeah, that was the first time I actually heard about, you know, the Bloods and Crips. Uh, what really I heard about them reading Monster Cody book. Okay. You know, and but I hadn't actually met none until maybe. Uh, the early two, uh, I mean, the early 90s when I actually went to Morganton High Rise, which is a youth uh, state prison from the age 14 to 21. Okay, okay. Wow. All right. So now, now that prison, so now how did that prison function? Like, and I guess in terms of how the inmates classify themselves, did they, did you click up by gang? Was it by race? Was it by like city and state? How did that work in that for state prison? It was um you, you gotta realize I was a juvenile. We're talking about I was 13, 14, 15. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we all had childish mindsets. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, you had individuals that was rolling with the Crips, which was, you know, hundreds in number. Um, you had the gangster disciples, the GDs, and they was a few hundred in number. Um, then you had the Nation of Gods and Earth, which were the five percenters, which was probably the largest group. And that was a group that I was a part of when I was at the youth spread. Okay. 
Now, you mentioned the GDs, and of course, that's being a Chicago gang. What was the earliest time that you heard that they were, remember hearing about them in North Carolina? Uh, the early 90s. Um, okay. Well, actually, like with the Kings, the GDs was our number one enemies mm -hmm. due to the fact that we descended from vice lords. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but when I actually like when I went to the uh, the youth spread, I met a guy there that supposedly had brought the GDs to the Carolinas, which okay. you know everyone had gave him the credit for that. But you know we was all peewees, so you know it ain't no way that a third. I mean, then again, it it, it is possible. But as I got older, I realized he wasn't the one that brought the GDs to Carolina. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But he 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 claimed that. Um, then there was another guy that I met who was rolling 60s, who uh, claimed that he was from California, and he started the rolling 60s in the Carolinas. I'm not gonna say his name. He's still alive. Um, but I found out later on when I went to the feds that this guy ain't even from California. Okay. Okay. You know. And um, mm. but he got that title in the Carolinas as being the founder of the Rolling Sixties in the Carolinas, and that he came from Cali. But you know, I spoke with some of the uh sixties when I was in the feds, and actually that guy was on the compound with us. Mm. And a few of the OGs from the sixties, they came to me because they was trying to figure out exactly who he was because the guy had the lingo down pat, like he knew mm. the streets. In Cali, he knew the stores. He knew everything as if he actually lived in California, but he never did. He just read books and talked to different people, and he took on that identity. Mm -hmm. But it got kind of bad uh, at the end because, well, it actually it didn't even turn out bad for him. It turned out bad for the Crips that was from California that kept trying to investigate him. And the guy got the green light from an OG 60 from California to smash the 60s that was investigating them. And this was at uh, Big Sandy, USP. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so you get out of that youth facility, you said at 18. So once you back out, what does your life take you? Man, when I got out, that was in like 96. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, it was lots of kings in Charlotte, mm -hmm. you know, because um, when I left, it wasn't nothing but a few of us, maybe eight, nine of us, you know, if that many. But when I mm -hmm. came home and I seen the different generations now, it was kind of like mind blowing because we didn't expect it to grow the way that it did. Cause you got to realize the Kings in Charlotte actually reached in the thousands at one time, you know, mm -hmm. and um, when I came home, all the original Kings um, was pretty much locked up. Um, my homeboy, Suge, he was still out. Um, my homeboy, Ken, and both of these guys are dead. Um, they were still out, but for the most part, everyone else was uh, still incarcerated. So okay. when I came home, I pretty much took the Kings by the reins, you know, and um, within my generation, the first generation, I was considered the baby. I was the youngest and I was the wildest because I was the youngest. So I felt I had more to prove, you know, mm -hmm. but um, at the time, I really didn't have leadership qualities. I didn't have leadership skills. Um, so I couldn't properly lead the group the way it's supposed to be led. <clears throat> and then when the older Kings came home, they really couldn't properly lead them because a lot of us were still uneducated. Like, you know, we was, mm -hmm. we had street smarts, but we didn't have the knowledge to actually direct the organization the way it's supposed to be directed, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a backlash from that because the criminal world of that organization took off, you know, okay. and um, 
but yeah, I tried my best. You got to realize I was only 18, you know, and you got people in the organization <clears throat> that was in their late twenties and early thirties, mm -hmm. you know, and they may feel some type of way of a kid trying to tell them what to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would have to respond with violence, mm -hmm. you know, to let them know like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm young and I'm reckless. You know, I can go do 20 years, 30 years and come home and, and be in my forties. You know, you can't do that. But that was my mentality. That was that slave mentality that I had at that time, you know? Okay, okay. All right. So so how long were you on the street uh, before you got back locked up? Wow. Uh, probably a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but within that course of that year, I was in and out of jail, catching cases here okay. and catching cases there. So, um, but none of the charges actually stuck with me, mm -hmm. you know, and for the record, I just want to set like, let it be known, like, I don't really have an adult record. I mean, I have oh, okay. one now, you see what I'm saying? I've been mm -hmm. committing crimes since I was 11 years old. So I was doing long stretches all the way up into my adult years, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I went to the feds for the first time, I really didn't have a background because I had a juvenile record. It was my juvenile record. You know, okay. so as an adult, I may have only two prior convictions. Mm -hmm. You know, so. All right. All right. So you get so. So what was it? If you care to share, what was it that brought you to the federal system? Uh, well, actually, I've been to the federal system twice. Okay. The first time I went to the federal system, I was 18 going on 19. And I went the first time for a gun charge. Mm -hmm. And I did approximately seven years for that charge. Oh, and right. I came home in 2003. But actually, when I first went to the feds, um, I had ran into some uh, some vice lords at uh, Beckley. I had went to an FCI, Beckley, West Virginia. And um, I had chopped it up with a couple of the guys out of Chicago and Tennessee. And... Um, we had some problems because they was trying to get me on count. And I was explaining to them, like, I'm not vice lord, I'm a king. You know, I was a vice lord, but we didn't get permission. So mm -hmm. they took it as, I think they looked at me as being, they thought I was by myself, but I had the Charlotte car behind me, you know, guys from my city. And, you know, about six or seven of them guys surrounded me. And one of my homeboys, he seen that, and he slid off because I gave him the eye contact. I'm thinking he could come on over there. But when he slid off, I'm like, man, this man left me by myself. But what he did was he went and got reinforcements and they came back 20, 30 deep and they approached. Mm -hmm. But anyway, long story short, we got that, you know, uh, situated. You know what I'm saying? And then come to find out an older guy from Chicago who was a five star university elite. He hit the compound and uh, me and him became, you know, best of friends. And come to find out the guy who approached when I first got there wasn't who he said he was and he didn't have the rank that he claimed that he had. Mm. You know, and he got disciplined for that, you know. Okay. But okay. yeah, when I got to the feds in my uh in my teen years, my late teens, you know, I was real heavy into the nation of gods and earth, the five percenters. Okay. Now you said an uh, interesting term you said out the the, on count, what, can you explain for the audience what does that mean? On count. Okay, uh, organizations within the federal system they have what they call being on count or off count. Like, if I'm a vice lord and I go to Big Sandy, mm -hmm. when I hit the yard, before you hit the yard, you got to go in front of the SIS. You know, they like the fears of the of the prison, and they go ask you. Is because you, your record, they go know if you vice lord or not, and they go ask you, is you go, are you going with the vice lords or are you going with the Midwest car? So if you say I'm going with the Midwest car, then you're saying you're not on count. So once you hit the yard, you can pretty much say, look, man, I'm not on count. You know, okay. but honestly, I think if you're from Chicago and you was vice lord, or GD, or P Stone, or whatever. I think you have to be on count because you're from okay. that city. 
You know, okay. like then you got the Bloods and Crips. They also got on and off count. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can be <clears throat> a Blood at another prison and then come to this to another particular prison and say you're not on count. You go ride with your car. Say if you're from mm -hmm. New York, you might get in the New York car. You're from Carolina, you go get in the Carolina car. Okay. You see what I'm saying? But <clears throat> you can't, once you make that decision, when you hit that yard, mm -hmm. once you make that decision on what car you go be with, whoever bring you your care package, that's who you with. So if someone bring you a care package from your city or your state, and you be like, nah, man, I'm on blood count, I'm on GD count, then they go turn around. You know what I'm saying? And somebody from the GD or blood, whatever set you claiming, they go bring, you know, whatever thing that you need. And once you accept that, that's where you at. Okay. You can't get off count and say, well, I want to be on Carolina time or I want to be on blood. I mean, uh, New York time. It don't work like that. Uh, one mm -hmm. situation uh, at Big Sandy, an individual tried that with the GD car. And um, mm -hmm. he was on South time. And he was a GD out of Tennessee. He tried to get on GD time after he'd been on the compound for about nine months. And I had no idea of what was going on. So I was coming back from child. The guy who was the shot caller had called a meeting with the South car and the GD car. And a lot mm -hmm. of the guys from the South car ran to me and was like, big homie, man, so-and-so called a meeting with the GDs. You know the man can't think. We're going to crash out. We need you to go down here and be diplomatic and, and, and bring some sense to the table. You know, because they was like, you very well versed in your words and you know how to communicate with people. And a lot of people respect you. So I went down there and um, the guy who was calling the shots for the GD, you know, he approached me and uh, he was like, the guy been on count for a couple months. And it was a shock to me because I didn't know it. And I was cool with the guy. He never told me. But long story short, I was able to mediate the problem. You know what I'm saying? And um, they came up with a decision on should they stab him up or give him that grace walk and let him just, you know, check himself in and go on PC. And a lot of people wanted to stab him up. But I stepped in again and was like, there's no need to do that. You know, just let the man go up. Because actually the guy came to me. Because he mm -hmm. couldn't be at the meeting. They had to have him stand off, you know, and somebody must have told him they were deciding his fate. So he came to me and asked me, you know, man, don't let him do me dirty, man. I go up top, I check in, whatever the case may be, but just don't let him do me dirty, you know. And I gave him my word and I was able to persuade, you know, everyone to be on the same page on letting the individual, you know, walk up. Because they thing was, if a person, the GDs was like, if a person want to get on count, they laws say that they have to let them on count. And like I told them, that's GD law. We don't go by them laws. You know what I'm saying? That's laws for y'all. And I said, furthermore, why would you accept a person on count that's been on compound for nine months? If he was really about that life, he would have got on count as soon as he got off the bus. Now he want to get on count because he see y'all doing certain things that he see beneficial for him. And they thought about it and was like, you know what? You're right. So yeah, we just, they sent them on up top. Okay. All right. So just to be clear then, so you have a choice. You can either be on clicked in with your city state car, or you can be clicked in with your street gang, but you have to make a choice. You can't go back and forth in that same exactly. facility. Exactly. But that's okay. only with the black groups. Okay. All right. How's it with, with, with some of the other groups? The other groups you always don't count. Like okay. Uh, you got different uh, Latino gangs that that's beefing and they try to keep them separated and, and, mm -hmm. and give each group their own yard. Mm -hmm. But if by any means that if you hit that yard and you the enemy and you by yourself and you know it's 300 Serenios on the yard mm -hmm. and you the only Nathaniel getting off the bus, guess what? You got to hit that yard. You can't say, uh, I'm going to check in. I don't want to go to the yard because they give you get a paperwork. They got paperwork. 
So when you go to the next prison, they go ask for that paperwork. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And it's going to show if you checked in or not. So okay. when they hit that yard, they have to put their life on the line and go out there. <clears throat> but what most people do is when they get to the uh, to the prison, before they even hit the yard in the orange, I mean, the, uh, the process center, they'll take off because it might mm -hmm. be two or three serenios ready to hit the yard. It might be one Nathaniel. So he'll just take his chance with them three. It's better to take mm -hmm. chance with three that you know ain't got no weapons than to go in the yard with 300 that got knives the size of your arm. Okay, okay. Well, that way it won't be on his jacket that he checked in. It'll show that he actually was in some type of physical confrontation. Okay. Now, let me ask you, speaking of other groups, now, say a group like, you know, Latin Kings, you know, Chicago-based group, but they're kind of, you know, nationwide as well. Have you ever observed what happens with them? Do they just roll Latin King? Do they roll Chicago car or Hispanic car? Oh, they pretty much roll Latin Kings. See, what you got to okay. realize in the feds, Chicago have a coalition. Mm -hmm. So vice lords, GDs, Latin Kings, a lot of them be in the same court. Okay. You see what I'm saying? And then if you from mm -hmm. Chicago or anywhere from the Midwest, you have a coalition with them as well. But mm -hmm. if you're not part of one of them groups, then you pretty much subordinate to them. Okay, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Now, 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 Ed, now, this is some very interesting, complex dynamics. So I want to add another layer to this. So say, you know, I'm a P-Stone from Chicago. You know, I've always rode P-Stone or maybe even rode my city. But somewhere along the line, I joined a prison gang, like one of the, you know, the big you know, African-American prison gangs or something like that. What happens then? Am I on count with that prison gang? Does my prison gang affiliation take place over my street gang or city state affiliation? Uh, yeah, of course. Like, but it's very rare that guys come in and become initiated into a gang if they're not already in one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I've heard stories like that in FCIs. Mm -hmm. You know, where they they do things of that nature, but in the pens. Mm -hmm you very rarely see individuals because you pretty much got grown men in there. Like who joined mm -hmm. gangs in thirties and 40 years old, you know? Um, <laughs> but okay. a lot of them that comes in already be, you know, a part of that. And okay. they just decide they're going to be on count or off count. All right. All right. Now, now I understand like, okay. So now did you, now when you, now how many different federal joints had you been through during your time inside? Uh, how many prisons? Yeah, fair, fair joints. Um, well, I've been to two FCIs. I've been to Beckley in the mid nineties, okay. and then I was sent to uh Pollock USP in the early two thousand. Okay. Um, also when I went back the second time for the Hidden Valley King case, uh, I was sent to Lee County USP, which is a penitentiary, and um. I stayed there about three years, a little over three years. And I was mm -hmm. actually able to make it to an FCI, which is a medium. Mm -hmm. But I was only there for a couple months until they found out um, what group that I was actually with. And they mm -hmm. told me that um, due to the uh, dynamics of that group, that we are not allowed in medium custody, that we got to do all our time in maximum security. Mm -hmm. And um I was sent back to the penitentiary. And this time, instead of sending me back to Lee County, they sent me to Big Sandy. And I stayed at Big Sandy uh, about six years, six, seven years. And then I uh, went from Big Sandy to Hazleton USP. And I was at Hazleton for a little over a year until um, I got out on the first step back. Okay. Now, did you notice any different uh, dynamics? Because my understanding of, like, federal joints that are, uh, on the West Coast have a lot of the California prison politics which is racial. Now, if you go to fair joints like in the Midwest or East Coast, it's a lot less of it. I mean, it's still some there, of course. Everything's racial in America, but it's a lot less. Did you, did you ever observe that? Uh, well, actually, a lot of times in them FCIs and lows and camps, mm -hmm. they don't be racial. But like in okay. the penitentiaries, 
mm-hmm. it's gonna always be racial, you know. Okay. And um, but I've I've been at uh at a prison to where the GDs, when something racial about to take place with mm-hmm. blacks, whites, Mexicans, or whatnot, I don't seen what GDs are say they go stand down for the simple fact they have Latinos in their organization or they have wow. whites in their organization. You know what uh-huh. I'm saying? So pretty much the rest of the, uh, the new African communities and organizations will have to ban and go against, you know, whatever other uh, races that we had to go up against at that time. But in the feds, you know, the whites and the Mexicans, you know, they ride together, mm-hmm. you know, and um, sometimes the natives arrive with the whites. Um, then you got like the Puerto Ricans, uh, they go ride with the blacks, um, the, uh, uh, Hondurians, um, the Colombians, you know, they, they ride the Cubans, they ride with blacks, Jamaicans, they go ride with the blacks. Um, but when you get down to the FCIs, it's not political. See, the penitentiary is, is, is politics. You know, and it's also it's, it's almost set up the way uh, California state politics is set up mm. in, in a prison system, you know, and I believe that come about because uh, a lot of the revolutionary uh, brothers and sisters that was coming in, in the, to the feds in the 70s, they came with that mentality, you know, and that mentality just grew over time, you know, because I had never heard of cars and things of that nature. That's something on the West Coast. But mm-hmm. now when you get into the feds and in the penitentiary, you hear the word car, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of politics. Like, um, for instance, you might have the Aryan Brotherhood on the compound and they might not get along with, I ain't gonna say not get along with the new Africans, but you know, um, they would have dealings with each other if it got anything to do with business. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because it's politics, you know, but um, politics can also be detrimental to you. It can be detrimental for you because it's all about who's um, who you can use to be pushed off to the side, depending on who they are as a person. If you don't, if you're not recognized through your characteristics of being a strong individual or somebody that has a name or influence, then you can become um, subject to those politics. You know what I'm saying? And then a lot of times money has a lot to play in it. You know, because I don't see situations where guys done did things that they should have been punished for, but because they had the finances and resources, they might get a pass. Okay. Okay. Now, now you mentioned now, like say for example, there's a situation where it's like you know you had the Serenos and Norteños. Those are hardcore rivals. So say if the Serenos and the Blacks get into it, or Serenos and Bloods, what do the, the Norteños do? They do they back the Serenos up, or they just kind of just hey stay to the side? Um. They, it, it depends. It depends. Um, they would never. They would never fight with the Serenios. Okay. You know. Um, actually, when it comes to the blacks and the feds, the Nathaniels only have an allegiance with one particular group. Okay. Within the feds, one particular mm-hmm. black group. So, mm-hmm. if that black group, which that black group will. If they get into the racial racial riots, then the Nathaniels get in for that reason because of their alliance with that particular group. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, now tell me more about because you know how unfortunately blacks are often more divided, even in the face of war, they often divide themselves. So in the fan system, because like you said, the GDs. You know, they you said they would kind of say, well, we're not gonna get into this racial thing because um, you know, we got whites and Latinos in the organization. Do you see a lot of that where black groups of you know different factions within the black car would say, Well, we're not getting into it, more is making an excuse, 
but you see more so of them coming together when it was time to fight other races? Uh, they more so come together. Not everyone, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? But the hardcore convicts, the prisoners, yeah, they, mm -hmm. they on the front lines. Okay. You know, um, but I'm not gonna lie, like, them white guys, they come home mm -hmm. because they outnumbered. You know what I'm saying? But whenever it get to that point when it's a race ride, you don't want to go to war under the gun. You want to get from that tower because they only go aim at the new Africans. They only aiming at the blacks. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because they go justified by saying that they're trying to protect the whites who are outnumbered. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, yeah, they 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 go hard. But you got cats like um, the DC car. You know, a lot of people didn't like the cats from DC. Uh, mm -hmm. me on the other hand, I was cool with a lot of them, you know, and, um, they pretty much stay off to themselves when certain things, as far as race rides, uh, pop off, but don't get me wrong. You have a lot of the older heads that been down for a while. They go get into it. They, they jumping out there, okay. you know? Okay. Yeah. And generally, and overall, cause like, you know, when I listen to a lot of these stories, people are always portraying the blacks as getting a short end of the stick or uh, you know how that goes from your experience did the when it came down to it did the blacks do their things i mean i know no one wins all the time some people say there's never really a winner in the race riot it's just who gets less hurt how did the blacks do most of the time from your experience ah that's it's hard for me to explain that because i be in the riot i can't you know <laughs> see what's going on you know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. But I hear <laughs> stories. I hear stories later on while we all locked down on so and so ran or uh this particular state, they ain't do what they were supposed to do, or you know what I'm saying, things of that nature. But um, mm. you know, you got you got um guys they go rock, and that and it mm. pretty much not all the blacks go pretty much get down, so it kind of like even the playing fields for the whites. Mm -hmm. you know because it's like when it comes to our people man it's like we've been conditioned and programmed to kill each other and fight each other mm -hmm. if we can bring that fear of the enemy fighting the enemy up out of our people we'll be a force to reckon with mm -hmm. and that's why you had certain political groups revolutionary groups that was trying to organize blacks under one banner you know, and um, so that we can start the process of changing a they mentality and 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 teaching them discipline and 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 um, subordinate to certain things. You know, and being organized. You know, mm -hmm. um, you had other groups that was organized, but they lack that that um, that that animal instinct of being able to survive and, and fight when it comes to the enemy. Now you can give them a knife, they'll go stab a black dude all day. But when it comes to the whites and the Latinos, some of them freeze up, not everybody, but a lot of them will freeze up. And we we trying to figure out a way to actually get them up out of that mindset because these brothers as warriors, they just been preconditioned through what a lot of people would say, the Willie Lynch syndrome, you know, of, of the divide and conquer thing. And a lot of them is divided, you know, because even these street organizations, most of the times when the deuces go off or the, the deuces, uh, the little panic button, the CEOs hit when it's an altercation, you know, whenever the deuces go off, it's almost nine times out of 10 in-house. You know what I'm saying? Organizations fighting each other or they have to discipline one of their own or somebody they say got to check in, don't want to go up top. He feel like he going to hold his own and they have to punish him, you know, to get him off the yard. All right. But, but yeah, so there's a lot of that, I guess, mental enslavement going on. But but by no means would you say the Blacks are just straight up victims though. They will rise to the occasion when need be. Yeah, I'm not going to say they be like victims, but mm. it's, if everyone was on board and on the same page, 
mm-hmm. and it wasn't no division amongst the different groups, mm-hmm. then we would be a force to reckon with because okay. we're the majority in the federal system. Mm-hmm. Okay. You see what I'm saying? And if we was able to get everyone up under the one banner of uh, one movement and 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 come to an understanding on, look, man, if anything happened between racial groups with us and other groups, we need to know that the people in your core, your organization go ride with us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's that. Okay, okay. Now, um, I want to ask you about like get back to like prison groups. Now, you know, of course, there's like there's cities, the city is like four main prison groups with the A, B, N, F, M, A, and B, G, F. You know, which those groups all kind of came up out of California. In your experience, do those groups still exist in the fair system, or are they all? I mean, I guess when I say exist, I mean are they in a place where people interact with them, or are they all just kind of like locked away in shoes and stuff like that? Um. They they still exist. Um, okay. The Aryan Brotherhood, they um, you know, they on the yards. Uh, a lot of the mm-hmm. a lot of the older cats from the Aryan Brotherhood, the West Coast, because you got different uh, groups that claim Aryan Brotherhood. You got the Aryan mm-hmm. Brotherhood of Texas. You got the Aryan Brotherhood of Arizona. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? But for the most part, the ones from the West Coast, they had kept all them brothers in lockup for a while. Mm-hmm. You know, and they had started letting them out a few years back. You know, um, the La Emmy Mexican Mafia. You know, they on the yard, mm-hmm. and um, they got a lot of power and a lot of respect from the inmates to the prison authorities. You know, yeah. um, the NF. You know, um, I very seldom came across. A NF member, most of them guys be locked down in ADX. Uh, mm-hmm. BGF, they got a few in, uh, that's locked down in ADX. Um, you have, you got BGF that's on the yard, um, mm-hmm. but they try to operate under the radar. Mm-hmm. You know, you would never know who's BGF until a war or something pop off. Okay. You know, why do they operate so clandestinely? For one, um, they're against the prison authorities. Okay. That's pretty much the only group that's actually against authority. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they whole mindset is to go at their oppressors. They acknowledge and understand that those who are keeping them captive is the true enemies. And okay. this is what, and this is what they try to uh, push on the main lines. Like, look, man, we all prisoners. We all have something in common. Our, our enemy is our oppressors, the ones with that turnkey. Them, the ones we need to be going at, you know. And they finally realized that a few years back during the hunger strikes out in California, you know. But um, I don't really know exactly. Um, what's going on as far as within the federal system, Mm -hmm. um, as far as with these different groups. um, Because after I came home in 2019, they had just started letting a lot of them guys out of ADX, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so I really can't speak on what's what's going on as of right now, you know? All right. right. I'm gonna change gears here. I mean, I can talk prison dynamics all day, but running out of time. So I'm going to ask you, okay, so after you do that last bid in federal prison and you get back to the street, where does your life take you from there? Were you at the point where I need to make a change or were you still like, I'm still in the game? Well, I knew for one, I had to make a change. Um, okay. the, game done, the game pretty much done change. Um, mm-hmm. You got rats out here that people know rats and still deal with the rats, you know, and as long as they got money, then they go deal with them. So that right mm-hmm. there automatically eliminated me from the game. Okay. You know, um, but my process of of my my elevation of me transcending transcending from a gangster mentality to a revolutionary mentality mentality started 
in the federal prison as I made my transition as a new African under oh, the, okay. the, the title of new African revolutionary nationalist. Okay. You know? okay. And um, I was taught the dynamics of what we stood for, what we fighting for. And once I, I understood that and realized who my true enemy was, mm -hmm. I created or develop this hatred towards my oppressor, you mm -hmm. know? And when I came home, my mindset was more like, you know what, man, I need to, I don't brought all this negativity into my community. I need to bring something positive. I need to, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to go down in history as being the monster that the government portrayed me as, you mm -hmm. know? So when I came home, uh, I reached out to a lot of brothers. Uh, most of the people that, I'm in contact with or incarcerated on the West Coast, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I work with these brothers and um, I'm the chairman, I mean, the assistant chairman of the WL NOLA Mentorship Program, which oh, is a community-based okay. community based program that's um, designed to help our people um, understand the dynamics of why they're in the position at the end to understand who their oppressors are um we have a um a curriculum that we give to the members of the mentorship program you know in this curriculum it, it, it obtains you know bulletins books pamphlets things that can raise their consciousness awareness you know and um not only that you know i'm working with other groups um i got a book you know about to come out uh beginning uh the end of march um the lady that I'm working with, my publisher, she's also into ministry and she have a couple black churches that's backing her up that wants that starting the uh, stop the violence movement. And they have asked me to be the face of this movement. You know, mm -hmm. and they'll back me up on the. Um, so I give my first speech, I think, in Atlanta in May, sometime in May of this year. And my next speech will be in Texas in July this year. Um, also, mm -hmm. I'll be working with Takuma from the August 3rd Collective. Um, the August 3rd Collective was started by Sanyinka Shakur, better known as Monster Cody. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be working with those brothers and um, as far as pushing uh, BAM out here in Charlotte, uh, Black August Memorial. Mm -hmm. um, also like with these churches, man, I'm trying to get it to where we can actually uh, build rec centers for the children to have somewhere mm -hmm. to go and free of charge. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of these kids don't have nowhere to channel their energy. And mm -hmm. I want to be able to build these centers or have these centers open up for them free of charge because a lot of these people in these urban communities, their parents can't afford $20 for their kids to go into these centers. So I want to mm -hmm. do that. And um, But it's, it's, it's a catch to it because you can't play on the PlayStation or go in the boxing ring or play basketball till you finish your homework, you yeah. know, cause they like after school programs. And also I want to set up a class where it teach, you know, black history and uh, get them history of the black Panthers, the black liberation army, things of that nature. You know, uh, it's a lot that we got going on. Are we putting in motion right now as I speak? Mm -hmm. A lot of it I can't speak on because it's still in motion. Also, yeah. I want to say that um, we have a, a hit artist out of Atlanta that's thinking about what his team said he may be thinking about jumping on board with me on the mm -hmm. Stop the Violence movement, you know? Okay. So, yeah, so we, we we trying to, you know, give back to the community and save these children out here. All right. Are you able to shout out the name of, of your book? Well, we had we had three, three uh, titles, but I think the title we go go with is the... Uh, the history of the Hidden Valley Kings. Okay. And when you can know, we expect it again? Around... Uh, sometime the end of March of this year. End of March. Okay, cool. But cool. actually, you would be able to pre order on Amazon the end of March. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, but it's a four book series. Any... A four, you said a four book series? Yeah, it's going to be a four book series. It's about the Hidden Valley Kings. It's actually my autobiography, but we have to okay, break nice. it down in four sections. Okay. Now, so before we close, do you have any like social media or how can people contact you if they're interested in like, you know, furthering the work you're doing? How, what's the best way people can reach you? Uh, they can reach me on Facebook on the Scope Abel 
or they can okay. reach me uh, via Gmail, uh, A-B-E-L-L-R-O-S-C-O-E at gmail.com. If they're interested in the WL Nolan uh, Mentorship Program and they want to talk to the chairman, uh, Kijana Tashiri Askari, they can reach him at w.l.nolan13 at gmail.com. Okay, cool, cool. Well, man, brother, I wish you, well, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your trans transformation from the criminal mentality to a revolutionary mentality. You know, we need that. Now, I really applaud you on being able to make that transformation. I know it wasn't easy. And then not only did you make your transformation, you try to take that energy and help other brothers. So I wish you all the success in that. And I just got to really thank you. And I really enjoyed your story. I'm looking forward to out reading that autobiography. And I just think, you know, taking time out today to come chop it up with me, brother. I really appreciate that. So in closing, any last shout out you want to give to anybody? Nah, not really. I just want to give a shout okay. out to the comrades out in, on the West Coast and all the other comrades that's, you know, standing up and, and got their boots on the ground, man, and trying to, you know, elevate these kids up out of the slums, mentally and physically. No doubt. Okay. Well, there you have it, YouTube. Um, There's been another edition of the Concrete and Steel Chronicles. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And until next time, be easy.